I think we're going to go way back in time now. Way back in time, at least as far as Americans are concerned. This would be one of the first songs ever published on these shores. The Bay Psalm Book, 1641. And of course, back then, they wouldn't put the actual music to the lyrics. What they would do is, down at the bottom of the page, to be sung to a sober tune. This is a sober Dutch tune. I lay me down and slept I wake. And a folk I will not fear, which me be setting round about in clothes. Not all of our forefathers' songs, Puritan forefathers, were fire and brimstone. They were human, after all, too. So I'm going to sing for you now what might be termed a dirty Puritan song. This is about Robin Goodfellow. Robin Goodfellow was the right-hand man of Satan. And if a young lady found herself married and in charge of a household, he might appear as a little very personable elf right alongside her hearth, and he would offer to help her with the chores. And he could, you see, because he had magic. Now, the more that she depended on his help, the bigger he got until ultimately he would become a full-blown Satan, and she would become a witch. That's one way it can happen. Robin Goodfellow. From Hegbred Marlin's time have I thus nightly reveled to and fro, for my pranksmen called me by the name of Robin Goodfellow. And ghosts and spirits who haunt the night, and hags and goblins do me know. If bell dames old, my feet have told, for I go laughing, whoa, ho, ho. With oh ho he and oh ho ho, my name is Robin Goodfellow. When house and hearth are sluttish lie, I pinch the maidens black and blue. Bed close from the bed pull I and show them naked all to view. Twixt sleep and awake I do them take, and on the key cold floor them throw. If out they cry, then forth I fly and loudly laugh out, whoa ho ho. With oh ho he and oh ho ho. My name is Robin Goodfellow. Ooh, oh, so here comes an ancient song, even by European standards. This song is 
probably a thousand years old. It's one of the great riddle songs. You see, when somebody was untrue to somebody back in the very old days, you wouldn't just come out and say, hey, are you untrue to me? No, you would ask that person a riddle. And if that person were true to you, then God would send an angel down to whisper the answer of the riddle into your ear. See? As some of my young friends observed, there are probably an awful lot of guilty people way back then. A riddle song. The devil has come up onto the surface of the earth and fallen for a pretty lady. But the pretty lady is betrothed to the weaver. Uh, for some reason, back in the old days, in the old songs, it's always the miller, the weaver, and the tailor that are getting messed up with the devil, or somehow or other. So he says, you're going to come with me. She goes, nay, 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 nay. And he says, okay, I'm going to ask you three questions. You mess up on just one of these questions, you're going to come along with me to you know where. So, hence, the riddles, the nine questions, here we go. As I said, probably a thousand years old, so popular in the early American New England colonies. You must answer me questions nine. Sing 99 and 90 to see if your gods are one of mine. Are you the weaver's bunny? What is higher than a tree? Sing 99 and 90 and what is deep? than the sea Are you the weaver's bunny? Heaven is higher than a tree Sing ninety-nine and ninety And hell is deeper than the sea and I am the weaver's bunny. What is whiter than the milk? Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And what is softer than the silk? Are you the weaver's bunny? Snow is whiter than the milk. Sing ninety-nine and ninety, and down is softer than the silk. And I am the weaver's body. So what is louder than a horn? Sing ninety-nine and ninety And what is sharper than a thorn? Are you the weaver's bunny? Thunder is louder than a horn Sing ninety-nine and ninety, and death is sharper than a thorn, and I am the weaver's bunny. What is more innocent than a lamb? Sing ninety-nine and ninety, 
And what is meaner than womankind? Are you the weaver's bunny? A babe's more innocent than a lamb. Sing ninety nine and ninety. And is she devil's meaner than womankind? And I am the weaver's bunny. You have answered me these questions nine. Sing ninety nine and ninety. You're one of God's. And none of mine, and you are the weavers, Bonnie. The Devil's Nine. Questions. Here's a song that has the rather peculiar distinction of being the first song ever censored on network television. Never mind that it was one of the most popular songs in early America, 1600s. But now Burl Ives was going to sing it, 1949, on the Ed Sullivan show, and the network censored went ballistic. Three days of negotiation and finally it was determined that he could sing the song provided he changed one word. The word was now. He had to change it to again. Put it in context. Originally it was now I am a bachelor and I live with my son colonial hanky panky. Change it to again, I am a bachelor. Will you see the difference? At some risk to your sensibilities, I will sing it in the original version as it was shared around the hearth sides in 17th century New England. a bachelor, I lived all alone, and I worked at the weaver's trade, and the only, only thing that I did that was wrong, was to woo a fair young maid. I summertime and part of the winter too and the only only thing that I did that was wrong was to keep her from the foggy foggy too One night she knelt close by my side While I was fast asleep She threw her arms around my neck Then began to weep She wept, she cried, she her hair. Ah, me, what could I do? So all night long I held her in 
in my heart Just to keep her from the foggy Foggy dew Now I am a bachelor And I live with my son We work at the weaver's trade And every single time that I look into his eyes He reminds me of the fair young maid He reminds me of the summertime And thought of the wind And the many, many times that I held her in my arms Just to keep her from the foggy Foggy Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Old Mammy Red from Marblehead Hanged from a tree till she was dead. That's a little children's ditty from Marblehead, Massachusetts. You see, there were a lot of witches back then. A lot of witches. My most favorite of all was one called Meg. Meg. Old Meg, folks called her, and oh lordy, she was a witch. She had all the necessary qualifications for being a witch. She was old, she was wrinkled, she was just a little bit on the ugly side, old Meg. She was so old, in fact, most folks, they couldn't even remember what family she belonged to. Now, old Meg, she worked as a woman weaver down in Narragansett Bay Colony. That meant that she would hire her services out to more prosperous folk, folk who could afford a loom. And old Meg, she worked in the loft of one of the local ministers. And those other women folk with her up there in the weaving loft, they knew she was a witch. Because you see, she, she would just sit for hour upon hour, staring off into her loom, never moving a muscle. They would be tempted to have words with her about this, you know, laziness and all. But they never did, because her being a witch, you know, you, you can't be too careful about witches. So they would watch and they would wait, and every so often she would commence to weave. And that shuttle would fly back and forth across the room. Bang, 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 bang. And strangely enough, at the end of every week, she had more cloth woven and of a finer quality than any other woman in all of Narragansett Bay Colony. Well, they knew it couldn't be the old woman all by herself. In fact, Lucy, now the minister's daughter, she heard old Meg's loom going all by itself one night up there in the weaving loft. And Joe Spink, now, Joe Spink, he knew for a fact about her being a witch. You see, he had bought some gumption from her. Gumption. You may have heard that term. My dear Aunt Edith would always be saying to me, either I didn't have enough gumption or I had too much gumption. Gumption. Hard cider. Real hard cider. And apparently old Meg, she brewed it on the side for a little extra spending money. And Joe Spink, he had bought some, and he was claiming that the last batch weren't strong enough when he was riding back into town to have it out with the old woman. Well, a bee came along, stung his horse on the end of the nose. The horse upended, jumped Joe Spink on the ground, and he broke his leg. 
Now that exact same moment that the bee came along and stung his horse on the end of the nose, Lucy, she saw a bee fly out of Old Meg's mouth up there in the weaving loft. Now it had been about 30 years or so since they had hanged the last witch in those parts. Folks started making plans. But then somebody got careless with the fire down the lower floor. Some sparks jumped out, caught a hold of the iron sheets, quickly spread to the blankets. Soon it was all smoke. Everybody raced out through the front door in their haste. They forget to tell old Meg. She's up there in the weaving loft, the bang, bang, bang of the shovel, her being a little bit hard of hearing. Pretty soon the loft filled with smoke. She realized something was wrong. She clambered down the ladder, wheezing and wiping smart eyes. She herself stumbled out through the front door. Now before anyone could make any shame-faced apologies to the old woman for leaving her behind in the house, she asked, where's the cat? Nobody knew where the cat was. In fact, as they hadn't even thought about it. Before they could stop her, old Meg had turned back into the flames. Two long minutes passed. And old Meg appeared at the front door with Tabby in her arms. Witches, you see, they got a thing with cats. And nobody ever saw her drink any water. Of course, everybody knows that water is fatal to witches. Now, the minister said she had no bread tucked up under her sleeves, and she never went to Sunday meet. Well, that would be a little bit too much for folk. They would have words with her about that. But whenever they did, she'd always look up at them and smile kind of, weird like and say I believe yeah <laughs> sure she believes well late one night the minister and his wife were coming back into town after doing their charity rounds when they come upon old May going out the other direction the old woman stumbled along holding her side and <sighs> gasping for breath Minister's wife looks up to her husband and says, Oh, Meg the witch. I think she's finally getting her just desserts. Yes, siree. Well, old Meg did not show up for work the following morning. The minister used her unexpected absence to good advantage. He preached a fiery proper sermon to those women folk up there in the weaving loft of what happens to you when you lead an unsanctified life. Well, they listened particularly a young girl over the back of the room because she'd been kind of friendly with old Meg. So after work was done, she threw her shawl around her shoulders and clambered down the ladder, raced out through the outskirts of town across the frozen fields for now it was the middle of February till she came to old Meg's hut about a mile and a half outside of town. Everything was dark. No sign of life. She tried knocking. Waited. Knocked again. And cautiously, she lifted the drawstring and she opened the door. And there, Inside that cold, black room lay Meg, all stiff and dead, on her old straw bed. Okay, she's dead. What are you going to do with her? Well, you can't bury her in a churchyard because she's a witch. Well, just dig a hole beside the hut, throw her in, cover her up, forget about Oh, wait a minute. You can't walk on a witch's grave. Well, then put just a big old rock on top and forget about it. And that's what they did. And winter passed into spring. Any good witch-hating folk went by that hut, they'd heave a rock at it. 
pretty soon all the walls and windows were burst in with great gaping holes. And spring passed into summer. It was late summer when some young boys decided they were going to pay this haunted hut a visit. They picked a high August afternoon when there weren't too many clouds in the sky because, well, when you're doing something dangerous, there's no sense taking chances. They worked their way up to that front door, mustered up their courage, kicked it open, and they just stood and stared. Because, you see, that old straw deathbed of Meg's, well, it had taken root and nurtured by the spring rains and the summer sun streaming in through those shattered windows. That old straw deathbed had grown into a profusion of bright meadow flowers. I am the mountain. I am the sky, I am the swallow, I fly and fly, I am the meadow, I nurse the land, I am the river. world and me. I am a part of the things I see. I am of nature. This is a true witch's tale. You go down to Narragansett Bay and you ask around long enough, you're gonna find someone that's gonna show you where that old hut once stood and where that stone still lies. Only now you see that stone has a single word carved into it. I'm of my maker I am I am